When you open up the pages of scriptures, it's very obvious that Jesus speaks with authority. It's very obvious that he speaks with authority because he is the Son of God after all. But unlike humans, God, in the form of Jesus Christ, does not hold on to that authority for himself or use it for his own advantage. No, Jesus gives people that authority. He gave it to his disciples, and he gives it to you and me so that we can go in his name and preach to people, tell them about the forgiveness of sins, and tell them about the love of God. Because it is through that message, through that authoritative message of Jesus, that souls are saved. Hello, my name is Vicar Tommy Welch, and along with Pastor Paul Zell, we're pleased to be able to bring you God's Word today. We're continuing in a worship series entitled Sound Bites. This worship, worship series is based on these pre-selected readings that are set before us. And in these pre-selected readings that we'll be taking a look at in the coming weeks, we will see Jesus, the authoritative Son of Man, speak very significant statements for you and I to listen to and to, to hear and take to heart. Because whenever Jesus speaks, we have the sound. And whenever he speaks, we bite into it, we consume it because it nourish, nourishes our souls. So when Jesus says something as authoritative as only he can say, we listen. Because it is only in his words that we find strength and nourishment for our souls, not just for this life, but for the life to come. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let us approach God and ask him for the forgiveness of sins asking him to forgive us in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Lord of life, I confess that I am by nature dead in sin, for faithless worrying and selfish pride, for sins of habit and sins of choice, for the evil I have done and the good I have failed to do. You should cast me away from your presence forever. O oh Lord, I am sorry for my sins. Forgive me for Jesus' sake. Christ has died. Christ has risen, and Christ will come again. In his great, great mercy, God has made us alive in his Son, Jesus Christ. We were once dead in our sins, but now we are alive because of what Jesus has done. Hear what Jesus Christ has to say to you through his called servant. Your sins are forgiven. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let us pray. O oh Lord, your ears are always open to the prayers of your humble servants who come to you in Jesus' name. Teach us always to ask according to your will that we may never fail to obtain the blessings you have promised. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Unlikely people can speak with authority, not because they have earned that authority for themselves, but because God has given it to them. Because God is the source of all authority on heaven and on earth. The first reading is from Amos chapter 7. Then Amaziah, the priest of Bethel, sent a message to Jeroboam, the king of Israel. Amos is raising a conspiracy against you in the very heart of Israel. The land cannot bear all his words, for this is what Amos is saying. Jeroboam will die by the sword, and Israel will surely go into exile, away from their native land. Then Amaziah said to Amos, Get out, you seer, go back to the land of Judah. Earn your bread there, and do your prophesying there. Don't prophesy anymore at Bethel, because this is the king's sanctuary and the temple of the kingdom. Amos answered Amaziah, I was neither a prophet nor the son of a prophet, but I was a shepherd, and I also took care of sycamore fig trees. But the Lord took me from tending the flock and said to me, Go and prophesy to my people Israel. This is the word of the Lord. Yes, God gives people his authority in order to preach and to spread his word. But he also charges those who share his word to reflect the source of of that very authority by being upstanding and godly people, examples with their lives. The second reading is from Titus chapter 1. 
The reason I left you in Crete was that you might be put in order what was left unfinished and appoint elders in every town as I directed you. An elder must be blameless, faithful to his wife, a man whose children believe and are not open to the charge of being wild and disobedient. Since an overseer manages God's household, he must be blameless, not overbearing, not quick-tempered, not given to drunkenness, not violent, not pursuing dishonest gain. Rather, he must be hospitable, one who loves what is good, who is self-controlled, upright, holy, and disciplined. He must hold firmly to the trustworthy message as it has been taught, so that he can encourage others by sound doctrine and refute those who oppose it. This is the word of the Lord. The Gospel reading from Mark chapter 6, verses 7 through 13, will serve as the basis for the sermon. Calling, to the tw- calling the twelve to him, he began to send them out two by two and gave them authority over impure spirits. These were his instructions. Take nothing for the journey except a staff. No bread, no bag, no money in your belts. Wear sandals, but not an extra shirt. Whenever you enter a house, stay there until you leave that town. And if any place will not welcome you or listen to you, leave that place and shake the dust off your feet as a testimony against them. They went out and preached that people should repent. They drove out many demons and anointed many sick people with oil and healed them. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise be to you, O Christ. When the day's responsibilities have come to an end, and I'm sitting in a comfortable chair with that remote control in my hand and channel surfing, now and then I'll, I'll pause at a soccer match. College soccer, North American Soccer League, some international match between England and Italy. I'll, I'll, I'll stop and watch for maybe, maybe five minutes. The reason I, I don't watch any longer than that is not because I have a, uh, an, an innate dislike for the game of soccer. It's the it's the most popular sport in the world. It's the, the beautiful game played and, and admired by billions of people, including some, some good friends of mine. You know, if, the problem simply is this. I, I never played soccer, never coached soccer. Uh, I, I don't know the, the history of the game, or I don't understand the rules. I, I don't know who the, who the best players are or, or have been. I, I don't understand the game. What I need, of course, is when I'm channel surfing, I, I, I need to have a, an authority sitting next to me, somebody who's become expert on the game from, from doing the very things that I've never done, playing or coaching or just watching it for, for many, many hours. I, I need somebody who can speak with authority about this is what's happening on that screen and that game so that I can appreciate it more. Of course, maybe that's not at all what you need. Maybe what you need is someone to speak with authority to you about how to decorate your home or, or how, how to do some gardening project. Maybe you need an authority who can, can in, properly install your garbage disposal or, or, or tell you what's, what's good to watch nowadays on, on, on Netflix. Uh, we all need somebody who can, who can speak with expertise and experience and clarity. We need an authority figure on all sorts of matters, including on the matters of God and how to how to enjoy being in his presence and be pleased to serve him and have have peace with God both now and and eternally. Nobody understood that better than the Lord Jesus himself. You get just 20 verses into this gospel according to St. Mark that we read from earlier. You get just 20 verses into the account and and St. Mark is saying that people were amazed at Jesus' teaching because he spoke as one who had authority. And, and why wouldn't he? He's the, 
eternal son of God. He's the, the word through whom God called all things into being. He's the, the serpent crusher, the, the long promised <clears throat> offspring of Abraham. He's the, the, the king who rules forever. Why wouldn't Jesus speak with authority that is beyond that of, of, of any other individual? And yet what he's also done is he's conferred his authority on others that they also might speak with expertise and with, with power. Today's account, there were the, the 12, the, the men that he called and designated to be his, his ambassadors or apostles. It was Simon whom he called Peter. James and his brother John, Andrew, Philip, Bartholomew, Thomas, even Judas Iscariot was included in that group at this time. And what the Lord did is he, he sent them out to the villages and towns nearby, told them, don't take anything with you except your walking stick. No bread for the journey, no change in your pockets, no, no knapsack with extra clothing on your back. Implication of that was that those who welcomed their message would provide for their needs. Still, he didn't send them out with nothing. He sent them with authority over unclean spirits, over, over demons who were taking hold of people's entire lives and over devils who were deceiving them. He gave them authority to, to heal people in his name. He, he, he gave them authority to direct people to repent, to admit their wrongs before God, and to be given through faith the righteousness of God. He gave them authority to say that God operates his kingdom, not with armies and earthly weapons, but with power of Christ himself as king who rules forever. And he told them, if any village or town doesn't welcome you, if, if some community doesn't receive your message, then when, you, when, you, when they send you packing, get to the edge of the town and, and pause and, and shake the dust off your feet as a testimony to them. We might say, perhaps, wipe off your hands and, yes, off your feet any responsibility for their guilt and for the, the judgment of God that they will receive for having rejected his message. The Lord multiplies, in a sense, his own authority by, by giving it to others. Still does that. You hear about that often, right? how the Lord gives this great commission to operate in his name to many, many people. Each of the, the, these gospel accounts, St. Mark's here and Luke's and, and Matthew's and John's, ends with a great commission. The best known is St. Matthew's, where Jesus says, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go with my authority and in my name. Go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely, he says, I am with you always to the very end of the age. With Jesus' ever-present authority conferred on us, you and I and the entire church baptizes in the saving name of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. With his ever-present authority conferred on us, you and I share the words of God's standards, his holy commands, which not only guide how human beings are to live and think and speak, but they also expose to us our wrongs. 
with his ever-present authority on us, we, we, yes, we speak that law that, that shows people their, their sins of thought, word, and deed, but we also, with his authority, speak of what Christ purchased at the cross, that forgiveness in his name. With, with his authority, we promise people that there is life and eternal salvation in the name of Jesus Christ, freely given through faith in him. Hard to imagine how many authorities the Lord has sent out into the world to bear witness in his name. At the same time, we also want to recognize that there are those, that, that narrower group of believers I'm referring to those who are the ones who preach and, and teach in the name of the Lord, publicly recognized for that. The first ones, I suppose you could say, in the New Testament era were these apostles, but through the Apostle Paul, we're also told that Christ gives to his church as a gift, preaching and teaching and counseling by his word authority to to those recognized as such by the whole church and even by the community in which they live. The most obvious example of such a person at the moment, the, the one most easily recognized for that is the, the, the person standing before you, as well as others who serve on your, your church's pastoral staff. I, I, don't, I don't boast about that. A, a pastor's authority is, is a, a gracious gift of the Lord given by the Holy Spirit through his church. It is not earned. It is not deserved. It, it, it's a gift that is given to individuals like me and others and, and received with fear and trembling about what a, what a responsibility that is. Nevertheless, I, I won't apologize that authority away either with some sort of aw oh, shucks mos, m modesty. It's a big deal that the Lord, as a gift to his church, gives those, those individuals who are recognized as ones who speak with the authority from the pulpit, in the classroom, and from a, from a counselor's chair. I know what you're thinking of. Over the centuries, a number of pastors, shepherds have abused the authority and, and scattered the Lord's sheep. That's why the Holy Spirit in, in letters like 1 Timothy and in Titus that we read, he gives a lengthy list of what are the qualifications of an overseer or elder or pastor in the Lord's church. He begins the list with an overall statement that such an individual needs to be blameless. He needs to be above reproach. He must be faithful to his wife. He must, must bring up his children in the, in the training and instruction of the Lord. He dare not be arrogant or quick-tempered. He, he must not ab abuse alcohol or be dishonest with money or, or ab abuse the people entrusted to his care. The, the list, he must be hospitable, one who loves what is good, who's self-controlled, upright, holy, and disciplined. And listen to this. He must hold firmly to the trustworthy message as it has been taught so that he can encourage others with sound doctrine and refute those who oppose it. And nobody's perfect, we'll say. Like every Christian, a pastor also is a, a sinner who desperately needs the, the forgiveness that's found in Christ. True enough, and yet because of the authority entrusted to their pastors, Every church must hold that individual to a very high standard. A sta high standard as to his morals, his conduct, and what he teaches and preaches, his doctrine. 
A pastor must also hold himself to such a one who's been entrusted with the, 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 the keys of the kingdom. Now, why is that so important? Because what a blessing it is if the devil and his minions are deceiving the world into declaring that which is evil to be good and that which is good to be evil, what a blessing it is when your shepherd has the authority to speak the truth of Christ and set you free from such deceptions. And what a blessing it is if your lack of patience has damaged relationships or if your laziness has left good and important deeds undone or if your spiritual carelessness has offended your God, what a blessing it is when your pastor speaks with the authority of Christ to, to show you your wrongs and then when you repent to speak words of forgiveness. And what a blessing it is if events have stirred up fear or frustration or anxiety. What a blessing it is when your pastor is able to speak with authority and say that Jesus Christ, the one who loved you so much that he gave up his life for you and then rose that you might have eternity in his name. What a blessing it also is when your pastor can speak with authority and say that Jesus Christ is right now seated on the throne at the right hand of the Father and directing all things for the good of his church. And what a blessing it is if your persistent and gentle witnessing has not been received by someone else, if, if they refuse to listen, refuse to accept what you're saying about their Savior, what a blessing it is when your shepherd can speak with authority and assure you that you don't carry that responsibility then yourself, but that that judgment falls upon God to deliver. And what a blessing it is when you yourself want to be a well-informed and clear witness of the love of Christ. And you have questions about that or need, need further instruction. What a, what a blessing it is that you can go to your pastor and your pastor can say, let me go to the word with you so that with the authority of Christ himself, you have the correct answers and speak in a way that, that honors him. That electrician that comes into your home in the state in which I live, that electrician needs at least two, if not four, years of experience. He needs to have passed a, a, a rigorous licensing exam and then to have been awarded a license. He needs to keep his license current with, with 10 hours of continuing education each year. That electrician then can come into your home with the authority from granted by the, the state in which, in which I live to, to hook up your air conditioner or to run wires from here to there and then to your breaker box correctly. That lawyer that your friend is considering hiring for a legal proceeding in, in this particular state that, law, that lawyer needs to have earned a, a college degree to have passed the, the, law school, the law school application test, to have completed law school, to have passed the state bar examination and then kept his legal status current with, with ethical behavior. Only then does the lawyer have the authority to represent your friend in a legal proceeding. Your pastors? In our fellowship of believers, each of them needs to have spent a number of years in college listening to the word of the Lord, studying it, even learning how to read it in the original languages. 
And then after earning that degree, your pastor needs to have earned a divinity degree from our seminary, which calls for not only ministry experience gained, but understanding of, of, of leadership skills and counseling skills, as well as many more hours spent learning the word of Christ. Your pastor needs to have been called by the Holy Spirit through the church to serve in his current capacity. And then along with that, he needs to have met the qualifications that scripture gives. Not only to be able to teach and be able to preach, but he needs to meet the qualifications of morals, of ethics, of behavior that is pleasing to the Lord and above reproach by the Lord's people. And he needs to hold to sound doctrine so that what you hear is sound, healthy, based on the word of Christ himself. Pray for your pastors. Pray fervently that the Lord would guide them and, and, and keep them faithful to the calling and the authority that they've been given. Pray that the Lord would direct more young Christian men to consider the pastoral ministry. Because what a blessing that is. That in your own experiences and in the experience of, of many others, someone will be speaking with the authority given by Christ himself and will represent him by how he lives his life. What a blessing that is, that Christ's authority is multiplied, not only through many witnesses, which include all Christians, but with those who are publicly recognized as, these are the ministers of Christ, publicly recognized as overseers of the church. What a blessing they are. Pray for them. And may the Lord continue to bless and lead every single one of them. Amen. Let us pray the prayer of the church. Dear Lord, you have authority over all things. Give your words to your people so that with your help the good news of Jesus may reach many. Rid us from thinking that our ability will make your work successful. Instead, have us rely on you as the source of our strength and the source of our ability and the source of the authority. You have authority over all things and you also care over all things, dear Lord. Be with those who struggle physically and mentally. May you send your people with your words so that your comfort and strength may give those who struggle a newfound resolve that comes from your promises. Watch over this nation and bless the leaders. Enable them to govern with fairness and integrity so that all your people may prosper and stay safe in your everlasting care. We pray all these things in the name of Jesus who taught us to pray the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look on you with favor and give you peace. Amen. Hello once again. On behalf of Pastor Paul Zell and myself and the rest of Living Savior, we would like to welcome you and thank you for joining our online worship service. If you'd like to learn more about Living Savior or if you'd like to consider donating or giving an offering, you can simply go to the church's website, lsavior.org. And if you'd like to give the offering or, or help in that way, you can go to lsavior.org slash give. May God bless you, and may you have a wonderful day in his grace.